Matthew chapter 6, sixth chapter of Matthew's gospel. You know, our, our commitment and our belief here is that it takes a church to raise children because every adult member of our church has a responsibility toward every child in our church to be a godly influence over them. And we can't settle just for the standards of the world because the standards of this world are set up by the prince and the power of this world system who is Satan. And Satan has set up the standards of this world specifically to detract us and deflect us and deter us from ever finding God, knowing the word of God, or doing the will of God with our life. And he gets us sidetracked on, off of so many things, and it can be things we even think are good things. It can be politics, it can be sports, it can be any number of things. But I suggest that every adult with biological children, uh, uh, to make sure that you take that responsibility for your children seriously. But even if you do not have children of your own, take up the, the challenge to nurture and admonish the children that God has brought here. But since you're not yet feeling me like I need you to, can I give you an experiential exegesis? Can I explain from your experience our responsibility to kids? Because every one of us need children in our lives, regardless of our age and stage in life. Because first off, notice if you will, kids will make you gray while they still keep you young. I never forget the late evangelist Buddy Cargill. Buddy was an ex member of a biker gang, and he was a huge man, intimidating stature. But Buddy's testimony was God grabbed his heart through his little daughter because it was when she was sick and he realized he could do nothing to help her that he finally realized he needed God. And then second, on the other hand, kids are God's way of making us unselfish. I mean, the frailty of their little form, God, God just calls something out of us. And our kids are not perfect, but they, they, they are practically the only true things in a counterfeit world. Why do I say that? Because they accurately measure and mirror what is going on in the, the adults who surround them. And that's why, and this is third, kids make you lose your mind up in here, but they also create love in you. And I don't see how anyone, saved or lost, believer, unbeliever, Christian, or any other religion, can hold an infant without praying for that child. Our overwhelming desire is to protect them and to guard them so that as they grow, we can guide them. So we need kids in our life. There are a number of ways that you can achieve that right here. You can volunteer to work with our Harvest Kids, which is our K through fifth graders. You can do that at either service time. You can become a junior high or a high school youth counselor. You, just to volunteer to chaperone or carpool a particular event. You can help kids learn their roles and their songs in the junior choir for the Christmas production as they practice on Sunday nights. Wednesday nights, you could join our Wanna team, you could make sure that the kids in our Bible club, two years old to sixth grade, become approved workmen that are not ashamed. Become a mentor for some young man or woman. Or, or, or just change the diapers of the future president of the United States. <laughs> Study was done of at risk kids in Washington, D.C., in New York City. Researchers were trying to find out what is it that keeps kids in the urban areas on the right path. And what they discovered was the difference between whether a child makes it or not is the presence of a single adult who honestly cares for them. And you've got to get that before you go because here's our thesis today. One caring adult can make all the difference in a child's life and you can be that person. So if you're here and you're not asleep, I know just what you're saying. Look, Alan, I don't know who told you I was going to be here today, but maybe it was my mother, my brother, or somebody else that I was just talking to about this very thing. And I was just telling them how inadequate I feel to either parent my child or how if I don't have kids, I don't want to ever have kids because I don't feel up to that challenge. And I hear what you're saying about every adult member of this church needing to be involved with our children in this church, but Alan, I'm scared. So don't let me leave here till you tell me, how can I fulfill my biblical responsibility as an adult to our young offspring, the heritage that the Lord has given to this church? 
I'd be glad to help you out. Give me a minute to unpack this passage. Matthew chapter 6. We'll clothe ourselves with its truth. Get our healing. Head out of here ready to invite somebody to come to church with us next Sunday. Because it's National Back to Church Sunday. And then, and then next Sunday I'm going to open a new series on how to find living faith in your family and for your family. And start, our, start us off with how to trust God with your marriage. But, but we need to learn how to work with our children while we, uh, while we are doing all that. So today, for a few moments and with your prayers, and by the aid of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, I want to focus the sermonic spotlight on a child's spirituality. Sometimes we think the Bible says nothing about these things, when in actuality, what it says and tells the adults about being spiritual becomes the instruction point that we need to teach our kids. Because a child's relationship with God is the most important relationship they'll have in their life. God did not create you or your kids to simply go to school, get a diploma, find a job, get married, make some money, buy a house, take vacations, retire, and die. But here's our first point for study. God created us and our kids to grow to know God and glorify God forever. That is what life is all about. And if you miss that, you miss the meaning of living. Because this life is preparation for the next life. So if you do not do anything else, make sure that you give the children in your life a spiritual foundation. It takes a church to teach children to know God. And this is critical for at least three reasons. First, this is letter A. It is our responsibility to raise spiritual kids. It is not the responsibility of the public school or our government. It is the responsibility of the church to be the church, to take the kids that God brings within our sphere of influence, and for the spiritual adults here to show them how to be spiritual. One person once said, whenever I saw my dad, I, didn't, I never knew if I was going to be slugged or hugged. Never knew how to predict how he might react to any request or any circumstance. So this is not optional. This is critical to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And we can start right now because as long as you come to this church, you will never lose your parenting responsibility. Now let me open a window on that word because I've discovered four stages in a man's life. And all of you who are dads, you know these four stages. First, you're small and you believe in Santa Claus. Then you grow up and you don't believe in Santa Claus. Then you have a child and you are Santa Claus. And finally, you grow old, you just look like Santa Claus. (laughs) So it is our responsibility to give our kids a spiritual foundation. But then secondly, this is letter B, it takes a church because the role of the church is the key to God's blessing for your family. Now I'm talking about a biblically functioning church with biblically literate teachers, biblically informed congregation, and biblically obedient leaders. See, speaking for God, the prophet Hosea declares this chilling word in chapter 4 and verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to to me. But that's not the only thing. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Say, expand that, Alan. Okay, I will. Families are dysfunctional because they do not know the word of God. Our culture is corrupt because we do not know God or the word of God. So don't dog on knowledge because God says when you reject knowledge, knowledge of him, knowledge of his word, your life will fall apart. And if we forget him like that, he will not remember our kids. If we forget to instruct our kids in how to be spiritual, then God's going to forget to bless them. Why? Because you cannot expect God to bless your family if he is not acknowledged by your family. You cannot expect his power if you do not acknowledge his presence. So it's our responsibility. It's the key to God's blessing. And then third, third, this is letter C. It takes a church because we are the secret to multi-generational success. What does that mean? Well, you're asking good questions this morning because it means what we do now or what we don't do now with our kids has the power to bless or unbless the next generation. They will live by the legacy we provide. Why should they have to start from scratch and reinvent the wheel? That will happen if we don't take our role seriously. 
But if we be the church and we act as the church, then they can stand on our shoulders and go higher. They can do more than we ever did by starting with what we leave them. Now, I think I put on your handout on the front page, Psalm 78, verses 4 to 7, right beneath the picture. And I want you to look at those verses because there are four generations in that passage. Watch. Verse 5, God commanded our forefathers, that's generation 1, that they should make known to us, that's generation 2. Then verse 6, that the generation to come might know them, that's generation 3, who should arise and declare them to their children, generation 4. And that's amazing me because here's our second point for study. You and I can influence other people who are not even alive yet. By who we are, how we live, and what we teach the children who surround us. We do not deserve the blessings God has given us. But we are the recipients, the benefactors of generations of godly believers who reach the lost, disciple the saved, and equip the saints to continue the work God started. As a result, this year, this month, this Sunday, this week, we are living in a multi-generational blessing. So look how good God is. I mean, God says even if you come from a family full of people who did not believe God, God gives you the opportunity to start a chain reaction. And you are the chain reaction change agent. You can have a legacy of faith and not fear, of hope and not despair, of love and not hate, of power and not defeat. And you do that by the choices that you make to involve yourself and engage in the kids' life of the kids of this church and their spiritual life. So today I want to show you the keys to raising kids to be spiritual. And really it's easy peasy lemon squeezy because it's all in the eight truths about God from the Lord's Prayer. Anybody want to hear that? Just say, give me the dope, Alan. Alan. Okay, I'll even take silence as consent because you may not know that the dope refers to something that's really cool. Okay, so it's, it's something really cool. There are eight truths about God that every child has to know. They're all found right here in the Lord's Prayer. Because the Lord's Prayer is not just to be prayed. It is a model of instruction for how to live a spiritual life. So how do we raise spiritual kids? First off, notice if you will, they need the key of God's presence. Let the whole church say presence. Our God is a living God, and so he wants a direct, personal, intimate relationship with us, just like he had with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look at verse 9, Matthew 6, 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven. That raises a question. What kind of father is our father? And if you had signed up for discipleship, well, by now you'd already discovered that right there in lesson one, because we list nine things for you about your heavenly father. And if you haven't signed up yet, you can sign up today. Go out to the, to the desk there in the lobby and just sign up. Because, you know, some dads are kind of mediocre. As a matter of fact, let me give you the numbers. 63% of all youth suicides. 90% of all homeless and runaway children. 85% of kids who beha- exhibit behavioral disorders. 71% of high school dropouts. 85% of incarcerated youth are from fatherless homes. Some fathers are apathetic or even absent. And yet God is a caring father, even if your father was not or is not around. God is close, even if your father is distant. God is consistent, even if your father is moody, impetuous, and temperamental. God is capable, even if your father is incompetent. And here's the good news. God wants to be your heavenly father. And your heavenly father wants a type of intimate relationship with, our, with you that he also wants with our kids, regardless of home life or upbringing. Children need boundaries. They need structure to make them feel safe. That's why we swaddle and coddle our babies. That's why we put pressure shirts on autistic children to make them feel secure. It calms them because it gives them a sense of security. And structure gives them a sense of connectedness. There's an epidemic today of low self-worth in our kids because we do not effectively communicate to them how they have a heavenly father who is capable, consistent, caring, and close. And that's different because our society is not built on that. We compare aptitude, academics, athletics, and achievement. And all I'm trying to say is when you know God, 
the issue of security is settled. When you know God as your heavenly father, the issue of meaning and purpose and fulfillment and satisfaction, that's all settled. God is present. He wants an intimate relationship with you. So second, second, on the other hand, Jesus moves beyond God's presence to the key of God's person. Let the whole church say person. And look in verse 9. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Sacred, holy, consecrated, sanctified is your name. Your person is set apart as sacred in my life. Now let me hit you with this definition because God's name represents God's character and person and the provision he brings by his presence in any given problem. That is why we study God's names. That's why a new name for God only showed up whenever some individual in the Bible was going through a problem. And God brought him through a problem and that revealed a new name. Okay, you, you know, God is the answer to your issue because each name represents a potential benefit in our lives. God has three primary names. Elohim, the created God. Jehovah, the covenant-keeping God. And Adonai, the controlling God. But attached to each one of those names are compound names because our God is a compound God. And if you want all that, you need to start coming on Sunday nights to get your doctrine down. What's the difference between El Shaddai, Jehovah Jireh, and Adonai Elohim? Well, you, you'll, okay, we'll, we'll show you that two, two, nights, two Sunday nights from tonight. So God's names point to God's character. God's names deserve my fear, my respect, and honor. To say, hallowed be thy name, is teaching a child to recognize that God is able to meet any need in their life. And all we have to do is call on his name, acknowledge his presence in order to get his power to accomplish his will. That's why in the Big Ten, the Big Ten Commandments, we're told not to use the name of the Lord in vain. Don't use it lightly, frivolously, profanely. Try to give emphasis to your cuss words with it. Why? Because we understand what the name of the Lord means. Proverbs 18, verse 10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. You have to honor God's name because there's power in that name. There's salvation in that name. There is healing in that name. There's deliverance in that name. There's just something about that name. It's the sweetest name I know. In the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, Satan just has to flee. Say his name, say his name. So third... To raise spiritual kids, we need the key of God's plan. Let the whole church say plan. And look at verse 10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In earth, okay, you're in heaven, but you know what? Your kingdom and will can be done right here. When you get saved by being born again, you're part of something big. Somewhere I, I saw this, it just it flashed by on my, uh, as I you know, was going through social media, so I tried to track it down this week. I couldn't find it. But somebody told Jay-Z at the VMAs, you know, success has changed you. You don't, you don't look like you used to. You ain't rolling like you used to. And he said, you didn't think we came all this way to stay the same, did you? <laughs> See, your child needs to know God's purpose for their life as part of a larger plan called God's kingdom. And this may shock you, but you are not the center of the universe. And neither are your kids, because the center belongs to God. And so here's our third point for study. If you will put Jesus at the center, he'll handle everything on your circumference. Amen. So if your, your little princess or your Mr. Man gets his way all the time, you are raising an insecure child. Until they learn, it's not about you, baby. They will be self-centered, self-absorbed, and doomed to the mindless pursuit of their own happiness. You cannot function like the world revolves around anybody but God. There were generations before us. There will be generations if the Lord tarries, generations after us. And when you recognize that, you get a profound profile of security and identity in Christ. So when you pray for God's plan, then forth you get God's provision. Let the whole church say provision. This is the path of positive parenting. Because since God can meet all your needs, you need to learn how to look to God. Okay, so watch verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Notice it does not say annual bread or quarterly bread or monthly bread, not even weekly bread. Why? Because it assumes you have a relationship with God that is daily. 
You have a quiet time. You have a devotion. You have a family altar. You take our prayer diary with you and you use it every week. So since you have this relationship daily, you pray daily. God wants us to learn to depend on him continuously. And here's our fourth point for study. Your goal as a parent is to raise your children from dependence on you to independent dependence on God. And you got to get that before you go because that is how you raise spiritual children. Transform them, transfer them in life authority from obedience to you by walking with you to being obedient to God by walking in the Spirit. But since none of us is ever perfect at doing that, the fifth key is God's pardon. Let the whole church say pardon. Verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we... As we, as we forgive our debtors. So we've got to teach our children that God forgives us specifically to give us the obligation to forgive others. Now, it is because you did not learn that while you were young that you cannot now forgive as an adult. The reason you cannot forgive as an adult is because you didn't learn that when you were young. I just saved you a therapy session right there. Make sure you put that extra money in the offering. So start doing now what you did not learn when you were young. Because in this life you will be hurt and so will your children. And whether you intend to or not, you will also cause hurt. Why? Because we live in a fallen world subject to failing flesh with an infernal foe. How would you forget that all these years? Here's how you deal with that kind of pain. Repentance. Confession, forgiveness. We've got to teach our children how to stay free of the bondage of emotional guilt and bitterness. We are guilty over things that we've done to others, and we're bitter about things that others have done to us. So so pray the right way every day. Start with repentance, confession, and getting forgiveness from God so you will have ample motivation to forgive others. And then forgive them freely from the heart in order to free yourself. Turn the job of revenge back over to God himself. Watch Romans 3 verses 10 and 23 say this. Romans 3 10. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. Why? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Not y'all have sinned. All have sinned. That means the Dalai Lama and the Pope. So God gives us a promise that neither one of those religious figures buy into. And you can buy into it today. Watch, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, how does he do that? He just told you in verse 7 of 1 John 1. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we confess, he forgives, and then he cleanses us. He cleanses our conscience. He cleanses us by the blood of Jesus. And that's the whole gospel in a nutshell right there. Because sometimes when kids, especially when they get into adolescence, they do all kinds of crazy. And you can turn your halo off high because you did it too. So the real issues are guilt, shame, and regret. But God's answers for that are not therapy and counseling, but pardon and forgiveness that comes through Christ. That's why we have to teach our children to be spiritual by asking forgiveness, accepting forgiveness, and offering forgiveness. Your kid's biggest problem in life will not be financial, intellectual, or emotional. Your kid's biggest problem is going to be relational based on sin and its consequences. So we have to learn how to function to operate in forgiveness by extending forgiveness. I just gave you the answer. Two closing things about that thought. First, the best way to teach this to them is to model it. Second, it's not until after you fulfilled this pardon thing that then God promises, and this is number six, his protection. Let the whole church say protection. Why? Because God will help you do what's right. Watch verse 13, Matthew 6. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is important to teach our kids because God does not just tell us what is right to do. He empowers us to do what is right. 
And the problem with a lot of parents is we tell kids what's right, but we do not teach them how to do what's right. Hello, somebody. There are only three basic temptations in life. If you look at 1 John 2, 16, it says, for all that is in the world. And then it lists the three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. That means the enemy of our souls is totally predictable. Paul says we're not ignorant of his devices. All the weapons he has, all the weapons he, he uses on you or your kids, they are the same ones he used on Adam, Eve, Abraham, Solomon, Samson, all the rest. Lust of the flesh, your passions. Lust of the eyes, your possessions. Pride of life, your position. Okay, I think I got it now. Passions ask, how does it feel? Because if loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. Possessions say, since I see it, I want it because i got to have it. Position is about sex, salary, and status. So the three temptations out there are to feel, to have, and to be. Same way it was in the garden. Nothing has changed since Eve. That is why we pray, air day, lead us not into temptation. And we already know, despite what your psychologist told you, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and 14, there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Watch, wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee. It's never a sin to be tempted. It's only a sin to give in. And since Satan utilizes your flesh to insert thoughts into your mind, then 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Because the thoughts are not sin, it's what you do with them. And God gives you ample provision in his principles, in his presence, and in Holy Ghost power in order to do what's right. So the good news is, and this is number seven, God's power. Let the whole church say power. power. Verse 13, for thine is the kingdom and the power. We and our children are surrounded both by dangers seen and unseen. But God's answer to the evil that swirls around us is his divine power through the Holy Spirit he's provided us. That is why you better be praying because let me hit you with this definition. All prayer is a plea. And prayer is how we give our acknowledgement of God's providence. There was a preacher one time, got on a hospital elevator, went out to, to visit a member in a hospital, and a lady got on with him. Now, since she was dressed in scrubs and had a stethoscope around her neck, he asked her what she did. She said, I'm a cardiologist. And then she went on to say, however, I, I am not just a cardiologist. I'm the one they call on when all the other cardiologists have failed. And then she said, what about you? What do you do? And without, without batting an eye, that preacher said, I work for the one that they call when you fail. <laughs> when the doctor fails, when the lawyer fails, when your family fails. I know somebody who has power. You can call him. His name is Jesus. And the final key to raising spiritual kids, and then we'll raise up out of here. We've got to teach them, this is number eight, teach them, th them to know God's peace. Because ultimately, we can rest in two things, God prov God's providence and his personal attendance through the Holy Spirit. So we have to teach them how to rest, not in getting the answer and not in getting the problem solved, but to rest in God's peace. Because you will only get it from him. Matthew 6, 13, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, if the Bible you're reading doesn't have that last little bit, you're reading from a defective Bible. I don't know what else to tell you. Come tonight, if you will come tonight. See, this is why the issue of Bible translations is so important. And that's why if you will come here tonight, I will explain all this as we look at the doctrine of the Bible and its translation. But stop and think about it. The devil wants to remove two things from your Bible, the most important things. So he did remove them from some ancient manuscripts. And today, skeptical scholars remove them from Bibles. And those two things are references to the blood and the kingdom. He wants to cut out the kingdom because that teaches you that this life is not all there is. 
God is, and, and you and your children should be, playing for the long term. So God's providence works to shape you for eternity, not just for time. Lamentations 3, verses 21 to 25, Jeremiah says, This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. Here's, here, here's what he says he recalls. It is of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul, therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. Everything you need is in God. So in closing, I've got to encourage you to make a decision today, a decision to believe God and choose Jesus for eternal life. Every head bowed, every eye closed, every Christian, please pray.